be a very special day. Hello, and welcome everybody to the Kitchen Sink Podcast. That's right, doing another episode after two years. And what brought me out of retirement, I'll tell you what brought me out of retirement, is my friend Chris Mack, the one and only, is moving to California to pursue his dream of being a filmmaker. So you know I had to dust off the old microphone and come in and interview this guy and talk about his journey with film and how much he loves it and how much he might not love certain aspects of it. <laughs> so how are you doing, Chris? What's going on? I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm I'm privileged to to bring about the resurrection of uh, the kitchen sink. Yeah, thank Everything. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. I just, uh, if you don't know, um, the last episode was probably, uh, I interviewed David and that was like, probably like two years ago. So yeah. Ah. So it's been or a year and a half maybe. So a it's, good guest to follow yeah. from what I've seen of him. Yeah, for sure. So uh, if you don't know, this basically this podcast is just about, you know, like how you got into film and your philosophy on film and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, it's just a casual hangout. And every time we hang out, we talk for a long oh, time yeah. about movies. So this is just like every other day for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which I'm very excited about. You know, it's like there's not a whole lot of people in my life I get to talk shop about film. That's and, true. And yeah. That's sad <laughs> yeah i know it's weird because it, it it's like i have a lot of friends but like n i only have like a few friends that are like really heavy in the film as much as me so it's pretty it's pretty cool to have those people to, to just you know shoot the breeze with yeah in terms of stuff but uh so for those who don't know chris mack is a writer director editor sound mixer <laughs> VFX artist. Uh, you basically do everything, but right? Uh, I mean, I'd like to stay in the lane of just a director writer. Um, right. But you know, you, the streets be wild. You got to do what you got to do. So I do like editing. I I'm fairly good at editing. When it comes to like sound mixing, sound design, not my bag. It's you your know, Achilles for, heel, kind of. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, coloring, not my bag. Yep, I feel that. Um. And, you know, I'm still learning as a writer, director, and editor. So, like, I'm not, I have not reached the mountaintop of anything. Uh, but, um, I mean, none of us have. That's what this podcast yeah. is about, you know? And so, uh, but yeah, so I'd like, I'd like to just stay in the lane of director, writer, um, and editor. And definitely editing for, like, music videos, but my own. I'm not trying to, like, edit other people's stuff, really. It's right. all for, right. all for me. So, gotcha. I got, I got, you know, I, I thought about this question the other day. This uh, this uh, director question. I wanted to get your take on it. I was I was just talking to myself in my head, and I'm like, is it more important to be a versatile director or to have your own style? You know, because hmm. like there are certain directors out there, like, and I'm not dissing on them by any means, but if you look at I don't know, uh, uh, like John Turtletub or like. Uh, Ruben Fleischer, you know, they don't really necessarily have like a style to them, but like they're ver so, but they're versatile. Like they can do movies. You know what I mean? You and will then, have to remind me some of their works. I okay. those are names I'm not super familiar with. Ruben Fleischer did like Venom, okay, Uncharted, yeah, Zombie Land, which you know, yeah, the both Zombie Land movies, which you know, you know, all I've seen. Yeah, unfortunate that I don't know who the director is, but yeah, and then John Turtletub did like The Meg and like National Treasure and stuff. Oh. But it's like I use those names just because those are kind of like it seems like those are the guys that you, like the studio just sort of pays, and mm -hmm. they're like, here, just make this movie, and they're like, okay, sure, and they're you know whatever, they just they make it, you know. But then you have these other directors who have more of a distinctive style and voice to them, you know. So do, do you think, and, and some directors maybe capture a balance of both, you know, but like, do you think, like, what do you think is more important to be more versatile or to have your own kind of style? Um, I think it's, uh, just important to follow one's own beat really like if mm -hmm. if being a versatile director works for some then cool like and and that can be versatile from 
I don't know. I interpret that more than just aesthetics wise and, and philosophy style, but also just work philosophy. Like if you're if you're bouncing from feature films to commercials to music videos um, and there and back again, I think that's a really cool versatility as, you know, uh, stepping into thinking more entrepreneurially about film and right. like, you know, uh, it's called show business and business has twice as many letters as show. Yeah. So, you know, I've been trying to think more about the business side and thinking about making deals and things like that. Um, so I think versatility stems even, even away from the craft. Um, but in terms of craft, um, I don't know. I, so I'm not going to rag on anyone. Um, right. But with certain directors, uh, I'm not interested in a director who does not have a distinct voice right. and that does not have a perspective to share in the world mm -hmm. um, and who uh, is just a, is a gun for hire. Right. Like, I'm, they're just uninteresting to me. Like, why would I, mm -hmm. why would I give my attention, which as I'm getting older is, is becoming so uh, valuable to me. Yeah. Um, why would I give that to someone who make something that's really just a, a studio cash grab. Yeah, because like it, the I feel like with a lot of those people who are guns for hires too, it's just they don't have the passion for it as the people who actually want to do it. You know what I mean? And the people yeah. who actually like treat it seriously and stuff like that. Um, you know, we're in the industry, but we're not like we're not like in the in the you know like in the industry yet. Yeah. So here's a term. Yeah. Here's a term that I think is really cool. Okay, hit me. So uh, the past two days I've been listening to like a uh, a podcast called Comics Lab. And okay. It's about being a cartoonist and a, a comic writer. So less comic book and more like uh, strips and things like that. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And it's been a really cool podcast. I want to learn more about the comic book industry. So really, not really cartooning, but um, but you know, these this is like the only industry podcast for that that right. I found that is quality. Right. Um, but they they threw out a term uh, called um, pro am. I think I've heard that, but I, what is that? So that would be like pro amateur. So that's oh, like okay. there's amateur, there's professional, and then somewhere in between is pro am. Yeah. Um, and for me, I think that's a really great term of like. Like, that is something that I feel really comfortable in right now in my career. Yeah. Like, I'm definitely not an amateur. Like, I'm not, I don't know, somebody could look at my work and say that, and I really wouldn't be offended at this point in stage. Um, but the the level of uh, just, like, intention that I'm putting into my work and, and trying to make that, like, big step into my career to... to really bridge into professional sure. yeah um this feels like a, a a pro am level um and it yeah and that feels like super um like validating as well when i heard that term i'm like wow that's a very validating place that for, is a good term for me so because i was just thinking about that the other day where i was like 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 you i don't i don't consider myself an amateur either you know but we're obviously not to the level of being like Hollywood level yet but you know not to toot our own horn here but I feel like our stuff kind of rises above a lot of you know amateur films that you, r you run across on like YouTube for example where you just have sort of you know like hobbyist filmmakers just making it for fun and stuff like we actually take the craft seriously and stuff like that so it's it's really cool to you know to have like a term that's like oh yeah like this is you know like obviously like there's prosumer like mm -hmm. when you talk about gear yeah but like pro am like pro amateur yeah that's pretty cool yeah and like you know i think guys who are hobbyists can be uh really polished and make something look really cool the oh, of course the point of um of like you know the bridge between like people who are just doing this as a an expensive hobby and people doing this for uh you know kind of a career or they're doing like corporate videos and making little short films on the side and submitting those to festivals like right. you know i think those are all val valid places too um yeah and that's it's a hard place to be cuz that's not what my, what i want my career to be but yeah, same. um but i think 
But some people are just happy in that lane. Yeah. You know, they're just happy staying in that lane. You know, they do corporate videos. They do music videos. They do local stuff. And it's like they, they make good money off of it. And it's like that's cool for them. And it's like that's great. But, you know, it's just it's not where I and I'm sure you, you know, I, we don't want to end up yeah. kind of in that realm. And there's nothing against that realm. Yeah. It's just that's not where we want to be, you right. know, because there's a difference between, I think, filmmakers and like uh, content creators slash videographers, you know. I mean, that's kind of a controversial thing to say because they they are filmmakers too in their own right, but there's a, there there is a difference, you know. But yeah, um, yeah, the, like the the boundary between like filmmaker, videographer content creator are lines that are getting so blurred to the point that like it feels hard critiquing anyone who is in those spaces true that um you know maybe it's just better not to critique at this yeah, point yeah, which is exactly. like which is like you know who <laughs> yeah. am i who am i to gatekeep the joy of right, like exactly. editing or the joy of of running a camera that's running the gear thing and that's the thing i i, I hate gatekeeping i hate geek, gatekeepers and it's like I was wondering, I was thinking about this the other day, and I want to get your take on it. Like, it's crazy how editing, like, let's just use editing as an example. Filmmaking in general has become more accessible, but editing, for example, used to be something that was so niche. Like, you had to, like, you had to go to a special school and, like, know someone who knew someone. It's like, becoming an editor was not necessarily, like, an accessible job for yeah. everyone. But now in today's world, everyone and their grandmother has an editing software that they can yeah. edit. I mean, even even our social media apps are editing yeah, devices. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of interesting because you have these people, and a lot of them are very talented kids who are making these amazing edits and like super cool stylized videos and music videos. And, and Yeah, it makes me super mad. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But it's like the crazy thing is, is like they... It's weird because we study the art of film, so it's like there are prop these people who are just editing just to edit, or you know they're editing just because they're watching YouTube videos and stuff. They probably don't even know what a match cut is, or like what a J cut is, or an L cut. Like they don't know that term. They don't know like what it is. Mm -hmm. They're just editing based yeah. on feeling. But they probably do it nonstop. Yeah, exactly. And and that's kind of like the gatekeeping language of of the film world that. You know, wants to make it this elite club. Yeah. Um, but like, screw Elias. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I always thought that too. Like on film sets, I'm like, they're like, oh, this is a, a stinger, and I'm like, it's like, the, I'm like, why is it called a stinger, not an extension cord? And they're like, that's because we're filmmakers, and that's yeah, that's why we call it a stinger. We have a code. We have a code, and I'm like, it's like it's ten one, ten two. It's like. Can't you just say you're going to the bathroom? And they're like, no. They're like, no. And I'm like, what's the like? I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It's like. Yeah, and yeah. and in some, you know, scenarios, I can see how that's like really effective language for a film set to run, and it's just like for really sure. easy to communicate. Um, but yeah, at at this pro am level, um, you know, whether it's it's editing and you're like, you know, working with someone and bringing someone up or or whatever, or you're on set with somebody, um, like, there's been countless times where, in our little pocket of Metro Detroit, yeah, where the industry is kind of weird, mm -hmm. um, hard to, you'd think in a, in a small, uh, in a small demographic, there would be, like, easier, it would be easier to make connections in yeah, that are genuine. Yeah, you would think, right? But it's really it's hard. Not, yeah, it's really weird. It's so um, weird. It's it is. It's really strange. And so I've you know I've pulled on my buddies who know nothing about film or filmmaking. That I'm like, same. yo, you're just you just got that midwestern hustle, that midwestern Detroit grit, and that's perfect for a film set. And you know how to plug in a light, and you're an intuitive guy. So I'm bringing you on, and they're great. And there's yeah. like plenty of people that I'm like, dude, you would just totally rock it in the film industry. You would be working nonstop. Yeah. If you were in the industry, but of course you'd be sacrificing your family and a lot of money <laughs> yeah, um, your, and your time and your sanity and yeah. all that stuff so it's like probably yeah. the safe move that you didn't do this but i wish <laughs> i could just put you in my pocket and right. keep you on every single film set. it's that like you said it's that blue collar mentality you know what i mean mm -hmm. 
that's the Michigan way. You know, yeah. it's a blue collar state. And, uh, but yeah, that kind of, that's interesting that, it, you know, it's so weird in Metro Detroit or Detroit area because there are filmmakers here and there are successful filmmakers here. And I, you know, I, I run across them online all the time and I'm like, how have I not known about this person? You right. know, but, and then I'm like, oh, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows that person. But it's just like, you think it would be easy just to be like, hey, like, we're in the same boat together. Like, let's let's make a film this weekend. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm still stuck in like the high school college days where you just get a bunch of friends together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like that's yeah, I feel you. That's kind of like what I really liked to do is just to get a bunch of people together and just make a movie, just because you have the passion for it, you know. Yeah, and this is. Uh, I don't know if you've come across him. I, I've tried to like share him around. Mm -hmm. There's a director called Pete O's. Have you heard of him? I have not. So Pete O's is really dope. Um, mm -hmm. I heard about him through, um, I think there's two film podcasts that I... Uh, is he from Michigan? No. He's oh, from, okay. Was in LA. Now he's in Texas or something. Gotcha. <coughs> and so... Um, but he's made like three films. One is called Youngstown, which is okay. absolutely delightful. Oh, did he make Past Lives or maybe? I, mean, I think I might be thinking of someone. I don't know. Yeah, I don't because there's there's like two movies that he's made that I've not seen or heard of. Mm -hmm. Um, but he just came out with a film called Jethica. Okay, and that premiered at South by Southwest and is doing good on streaming services right now, or at least that's what Pete is sharing on Instagram. Right, and so. In his interviews on these various podcast uh, interviews that I've listened to him, like Indie Film Hustle and Show Don't Tell, I think is where I have listened to him the most. Um, he just has like a really great philosophy behind filmmaking that's like, you know, why do we do this? Uh, do we do it because the world needs more movies? No, there's like, you know, the streaming wars are right. are upon <laughs> us. Um, we're all collateral damage. Right. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, so no, we don't need more movies. Um, do we do this to make tons of money? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. I mean, most working directors probably are not balling out. The nah. Yeah, you know, you think of like your your favorite director who's not in like the A list of directors. Right. They're probably living a very modest life. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah, money is not really the the thing, but. And so he just simply says, like, it's just a fun way to spend time. Like, it's yeah. a fun way to spend time to do something creative. And, um, you know, I would add in there personally just a love of the medium. Mm -hmm. Like, it's such a fascinating, unique medium that, um, <clears throat> you know, you don't really need, like, just, uh, you know, nature-given talent, natural talent mm -hmm. to be good in. Um, yeah. Like, you think about painting, you think about art and illustration, drawing, um, and it's just, like, such a, there's such a level to it that's, like, I could never, I could never right. paint like that. Um, and maybe that's a devotion thing. Maybe that's a, maybe there's still, like, a, a learning aspect that I could do better in, but um, I feel like there is still just talent. Yeah. And you can bring talent to a film set, but you can get really far and just hustle and grit, and there is... A lot of high tier directors who have just done that. <laughs> For sure. You know, I um there's like uh I wanted to kinda of get into a, we're mentioning philosophy about filmmaking a lot and that's really cool that you say that because uh I was wondering who like what directors do you look up to in terms of filmmaking philosophy? Like for me, for example, uh, Sam Raimi and Robert Rodriguez are probably they're some of my favorite. They're, there's they're probably and James Wan too. They're they're those those three are like some of my biggest inspirations when it comes to filmmaking. Now, do I think they're the best directors of all time? I mean, probably not, obviously. Mm -hmm. But like, but I admire their filmmaking philosophy yeah, for sure. You know, especially Robert Rodriguez because I would say that you know I read Rebel Without a Cause early on in my filmmaking career and I, I, I would say I'm a child of mariachi mm -hmm. style filmmaking. Yeah. You know, so like who in your mind is like philosophy wise, like do you subscribe to, if any? Um that's tough because I don't know if I've really have like delved deep into uh 
other directors philosophies Mm -hmm. um especially when it's like guys who don't write books about their work like rebel without a crew is great uh and it was like super rewarding to read that um and just to be super inspired by that for sure I wish I had read it sooner. And the ten minute film schools too. Have you seen yeah. those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are great. Uh and even he has a he has like a show on uh, on Amazon Prime that's mm-hmm. I think Rebel Without a Crew is the yeah, show. Yeah, I, it, and that's he did uh Red, Red Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Yep, I saw that. Um mm-hmm. and that's a really cool thing to come across that's like uh that's just another area of the industry. Like there's no budget films out there. Yeah. And film school didn't touch those. It was like here's Hollywood, here's Indie Wood. And that's it. Yeah. And then there's this whole other like dark corner of the room where mm-hmm. everyone is at, and uh, you know they're making micro budget to no budget films, and like no one talks about this, and no one. Yeah. And like some of them are really good, and some of them make it out of that to breach into a cultural stance, but for sure. Um, but for philosophy, um, <coughs> when I think of uh philosophy. The first guy that comes to my mind is Jeff Nichols. Um, yes, I, you know, you know that I love Jeff Nichols. I think he's he's a Same. great filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, and you know, not a bad film. He doesn't have a bad film in his uh, line of work. I think Mud is a masterpiece. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Personally, without love, a doubt. I love Mud. Such a good, Mud, such a good movie. Mud is in my top four for sure. Nice, um, and but. He, even beyond filmmaking, I think I attach to his uh, to his philosophy on business, the the business side of of the work. Of um, and it's funny that I've like I've said this twice now within the conversation of like bringing it to the business side of of show business. But um, you know, he just is a guy that has stayed in his lane and done what he's wanted to do like he's been offered he was offered and pitched for aquaman oh wow i didn't know that yeah actually. so <clears throat> was he supposed to do a quiet the a quiet is he still oh, doing yeah. a quiet place or yeah uh like I don't that's know. a good question there is a, a a quiet place prequel movie coming out yeah that he was offered and like committed to um i don't know if he's doing that because the bike riders is out now yeah which and, looks great. Yeah, I remember I saw that and I immediately sent it to you. I was like, "This has Chris written." Yeah, all over it. I'm like, "Yeah, I'm oh, super yeah. excited for it." Yeah. Um, but he, you know, on the business side of things, he's just been like super level headed and being like, "You know what? I don't, I don't want to work like that. I don't want to work within that specific way. So I'm just gonna do things my own way." Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been a while since I've like looked up his interviews on those. Um, I have them saved on Pinterest, um, but so it's like thinking like that um, is really inspiring to me on the business side of things. When I think about filmmaking philosophy, um, there's a current little debate. Well, there was like earlier this month with the release of Napoleon, and Ridley Scott was getting. Uh, getting all of his attention yeah they were like quizzing him on some things and asking him some questions and he made a point to say um out of all of my body of work never received an oscar for it Mm -hmm. um and i've made like twice the amount of films as all the oscar contender directors which is like yeah kudos yeah kudos man you've like the dude does work for sure and he's like he's been doing work for so long yeah you know he's like in his late 70s yeah and he's still killing it you know <coughs> yeah he's definitely uh a quantity guy oh yeah. Uh, yeah he's i don't know if he's always a quality to guy though and that's yeah. that's the thing to me that's like i think he pointed out scorsese directly that he's like yeah within the amount of time that took him from the irishman to Killers of the Flower Moon, I've made like eight movies or something like that. I don't know what he said directly. Yeah, but, but uh, which is like, hey, valid point. Yeah, uh, but one of those cool. movies was Alien Covenant. So. <laughs> 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 right, right. <laughs> um, oh, I think that's what a lot of people said in the comments too. Oh, really? Nice. Uh, 
They were like, yeah, <laughs> let's let's look, let's analyze some of those. You know, yeah, you got House yeah. of Gucci in there. Ooh. Um, e, uh, yeah. You know, I haven't seen it. I don't know. Maybe it's yeah, great. Yeah, Adam sure. Driver's always great. Lady Gaga's, yeah. uh, you know, you know Gaga. she's, she's there. But then you got the master himself, Jared Leto. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, no disrespect. No disrespect. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to craftsmanship, um, you know, obviously Ridley knows what he's doing. He's For made, sure. you know. No one can deny the masterpieces that are Alien, Blade Runner, mm -hmm. Gladiator, um, <clears throat> and then... Even mixed... The Martian, I really like. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's a classic, but I yeah. do like that one. I just remember being like, I don't know why I'm watching this yeah. in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> um, no shade. It just wasn't yeah. for me. Gotcha. You know, It's gotcha. not a bad film, just not my taste. Gotcha. Um, I feel like it's more Drew Goddard's film than... Ridley Scott's film, yeah, but you know, yeah. Um, now, w kind of bouncing back, yeah. You want to talk about a versatile director, yeah. Ridley Scott is a, um, is a, voiceful, versatile director, yeah. And he's probably the best example of that. Mm -hmm. Of that is someone who can like bounce around genres, mm -hmm. um, and do them at a high level that is better than the the rest. Still doesn't kind of get you awards, right? Because you're so versatile, I think you're missing some things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, no one can deny his craftsmanship. Yeah, I mean, I saw Napoleon, didn't love it. Thought it was a little boring. Um, okay. Yeah, I didn't see it, but but uh, but you know, I'm not gonna sit there and deny like, oh wow, that'd be really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, and the amount of like people to gather into this one scene and to block that and choreograph it's, it and to get it done in a certain amount of time mm -hmm. that's uh that's only something a master can do so yeah he's he's yeah he is one of the greats i mean because like he he knows how to get movies done within budget and on mm -hmm. time you know yeah you know i don't i don't think i've ever heard like a story of like how i guess well blade runner had some you know tumultuous mm -hmm. things like post-production wise but you know he uh <laughs> Seems like he really, you know, just takes it on the chin like, like yeah. a champ. So and so, I think you know, on the other side of that coin, you go from quality to quantity, mm -hmm. um, or vice versa. You go from Ridley Scott's quantity to, let's say, Scorsese's quality, mm -hmm. or um, Tarantino was only making ten films. Yeah, that mm -hmm. I don't agree with. Yeah, uh, you know, I kind of line up with Scorsese on that one. Of yeah. like, you know, you got. You still got some steam in the engine. You might yeah, as well make some. Like, why cap yourself? Yeah, I don't get that. I don't get um, that either. I, I even don't get it. even as a guy like myself who I'm like, I want to I want to make a music project. I want to make comic books. I want to yeah. make a film. Like, I want to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, you know, maybe I'll see the end of of film. But film is definitely my strongest uh, medium that I want to work through. And right. Tarantino is obviously. Like that's his strongest medium. Yeah. So I don't know why he would cap himself at that, but yeah. maybe he wants to get out before he gets swept by his own, you know. Work. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but I think Sorry. it's like he just doesn't want to decline. He said. Yeah. You know, like which is fair. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of directors out there who uh, I won't name, but you know, they they've definitely dipped in their quality. Yeah. Even some of the greats. Yeah, for have, sure. Have dipped in their quality, but. Age, like, age will always catch yeah, up to you. Exactly, exactly. But I don't know. I don't. I don't agree with just doing ten movies either. You know, because I remember uh, I, this actually was just released. I don't know if you saw it, but there was an article that came out about his uh, Star Trek mm -hmm. project and yeah. how he was writing it with another writer, and th that writer came out and he said they asked him like, "What was the biggest hurdle for Quentin?" when it came to that movie, why it was never made. And he said, basically, he's like, the biggest hurdle with Quentin was he didn't want Star Trek to be his final film. <clears throat> he's like, yeah. he just couldn't get past that. Super weird. Yeah, and I'm just like, well, just if you didn't... Just don't make your final film? <laughs> yeah, just just keep making movies. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, then you would be able to do Star Trek and you would be able to do anything you want, you know? Right. Because that's fun, you know? I mean, I'm sure it's someone with his status, you know, he wants to do the the more artistic, more, you know, gravitas. Yeah. You know, but it's like at the same time, it's like he probably wants to, I mean, 
I'd want to do like friggin' Star Trek or Star Wars or Marvel or. I want to do you know. every film that's in my head. Yeah, I don't exactly. know, like I don't know why exactly. you would, yeah. uh, you know, not want to do that. And yeah, maybe like, maybe Tarantino is just like really OCD. You wouldn't guess it from his films, but maybe he's just like a really big numbers guy. Yeah, and he's like. 10 10 yeah. is the thing it's weird though because he does count kill bill one and two as one movie so technically he's going to have 11 movies but he counts kill bill one and two as one movie hmm. yeah people used to be like oh he doesn't count death proof but no he counts death proof it's just he counts kill bill one and two as one movie which is interesting so yeah that's yeah. a mm-hmm. that's a technicality get yeah. you on the technicalities there Tarantino. right, right. um <laughs> but uh, Look at us being a cliche. <laughs> Talking about Quentin Tarantino on a film podcast. Oh my god! How gosh. can't you? Wow. Um, Seriously, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, you threw out some some random names uh, that were yeah true off the beaten path. True, so true. We're, we're doing good for cliches. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just round this back to philosophy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I I want to do quality films uh i want them to do well uh mm-hmm. and so that's kind of like the business side yeah um and i want them to uh you know open me up for making more and yeah. i don't you know i i think if we looked at i guess that's where i'm rounding out uh when i look at directors and seeing I guess their their philosophy towards quality and quantity. Uh, I would lean more into qu- quality For sure. um, than quantity. But like I said, I want to make every every film that's in my head. So yeah, yeah. Which same. is, you know, I think I think that's the ultimate dream of a filmmaker is to just make the movies you want to make, <laughs> and nothing hindering you. And obviously, that's. That's just not the way the world is, you know, especially yeah. the film world. But I mean, to I look at people like, you know, like you said, like Jeff Nichols or um, Terrence Malick, who's one of my favorite directors. Oh, yeah. I love Terrence Malick. Same. It's like Terrence Malick literally makes a movie just like when he feels like it. He's like, you know, what? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make a movie. And yeah. then it's like it's going to be in the editing room for like three years. Yeah. He's like, I'm not going to release it until I want to release it. And then he does. And then it goes to like theaters and streaming and mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's yeah. like that's the dream is like, yeah, just make movies whenever you feel like it, you know. But, you know, that's uh, that's not the privilege that a lot of uh, filmmakers have in the industry. A lot of it is like, how much money did you make this person? Yeah. And how many awards did they, you know, did um, they give you? As James Cameron said, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another uh, cliche to hit. Um, although I don't hear this name tossed around on indie, indie film hustle a lot. Um, Wes Anderson in yeah. the mix. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess from just watching his movies, not listening to a lot of his commentary on things, or you know, working philosophy. Um, what I like about him is that he's a guy that people want to work with. Yeah, like any actor, you you know, you ask any actor uh, if they want to like work with Wes Anderson answer is probably gonna be yes um and I watched this Ed Norton interview where he's like being asked about uh how much he makes or something like that oh yeah I saw Um, that he's like oh yeah with uh with uh Asteroid City I lost money on that probably you know I got paid nothing to do that right um and you know lost money to do it but I love working with Wes Anderson like I will never pass up a uh, moment to work with him and that's sure. you have to be such a like either a you have to be such a good filmmaker mm-hmm. that people will put up with you to do that and for to, months on yeah, end yeah and to take a low pay to do it yeah <coughs> or b um you're just a really great person to work with and people enjoy yeah. being around you yeah. uh i would like to be both of those things yeah um and that's who, who I hope to be on set, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm not trying to be a, a jerk on set or anything. And I want to be, uh, mm-hmm. you know, good at my craft. Yeah. And so I think that's uh, a good example of 
of philosophy that isn't spoken but acted out that um, is like, you know what, I want to make quality stuff. I want to be the guy that people want to work with. Absolutely. You know, know, there is that sort of cliche of, um, or like there's this um, stereotype of directors being these really loud, obnoxious kind of jerks who push actors to, you know, go beyond their comfort level and, you know, putting people in danger and stuff like that on the more extreme cases. And there definitely are directors like that in stories where I listen to it and I'm like, that's insane. I'm like, that's just too much. That's crazy. You know, but I think that's a myth that you have to be a jerk to be a director. But I do think that there is a certain level of um, standing your ground uh, or and like just, you know, being just stern and like, I, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, I, for sure. I'm just trying to find the words. It's like you don't have to be a D-bag, mm-hmm. but like. You know, David David F. Sandberg, who yeah. we're both again a fan of and talk about regularly, mm-hmm. um, talks about Smasher himself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, talks about this a little bit and talks about how, like, you know, he's an introverted guy. Mm-hmm. He's kind of quiet and keeps to himself. And it got to a point on one of his horror films, like one of the Annabelle movies, mm-hmm. that um, you know people weren't taking him very seriously, and and. Uh, George Miller also attests to this. That's like you can't, you know, there's this kind of philosophy of like if you're a nice guy, you're a pushover, so you have to kind of be a jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, David S. Sandberg kind of re retouches that a little bit. Basically, mm-hmm. that was George Miller's philosophy that was communicated that like, yeah, you just got to end up being a jerk or you're also going to get pushed over. Right. And even if you're not, you just got to act like it mm-hmm. so you can get what you need. Um, David F. Sandberg kind of took that and was just like, yeah, when you're on set, you know, you do just have to pull out your big boy voice and, and be like, shut the F up. And that was yeah. his direct quote um, mm-hmm. of like, you know, people are talking. It's quiet on set. You know, as the director, don't be afraid to like get mad and to show that and communicate that. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and I think that's really fair. Um, but... Uh, there, there is a line, you know, like anyone who works with a, a kind of a, um, dictator of a director is like in any other career field, this would not be okay. Right. How you're treating a human being, yeah. it doesn't matter that you're like, you know, artifying it and being like, oh, it's for the craft. So I have to treat this person like crap to get emotional tears out of them. Like, right. no, they're a human being. You hired a professional. That's right. It is on you to communicate better. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. you do not get the right to treat someone like a jerk just because, like, it's for the craft. Right. And I, you know, that kind of touches into our commitment to our faith Mm -hmm. and following the ways of of Christ is like... Exactly. I was going to touch on that, too, in the podcast. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just completely ridiculous that the things that we ask people to do in this industry... Yeah. Um, are somehow like okay because it's on a film set and it's like oh. like you know we kind of joked about Jerry Leto and some of like the antics that he's done on set yeah Um, it's like uh, you hear some of those stories and it's like click 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 uh, hello HR yeah, uh, we right. have a problem yeah and, it's like you, know, you can't do that yeah, yeah. and exactly. it's like it doesn't matter what level of like craftsmanship you're at whether a director or actor that you can just treat people like they're you know, caricatures themselves or that they're, uh, you know, a mule to talk, you know, talk down to. Yeah. And, you know, executives do this too. I just watched this, uh, this video put on by Patrick H. Willems, who's Mm -hmm. always great. Um, and he did this, uh, this video on, um, high concept film and of the eighties, the producers of Top Gun. Um, I forget uh, like guy. Jerry Bruckheimer? Yeah, or? Bruckheimer. Okay. Mm-hmm. Talks about how, like, at at 4 p.m. every day, he would call a screenwriter and just, like, berate them and be like, you're worthless, you're nothing, you're trash. Like, just any screenwriter, huh. just call them. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, if I was that screenwriter, I would not hesitate to hang up the phone. Yeah. And That's crazy. Like, I would not just sit there and take that just because, like, my career is on the line. It's like, yeah, it's like first nah. of all, have a backbone. Second yeah. of all, um... 
Like, that's not okay. Like, no, it's not. And, of course, that's the 80s, and it's different, mm-hmm. and there's better but things now. But the indi- like, I mean, the industry is still pretty you yeah. know, messed up in a lot of regards, you know. For sure. And I, want, I wanted to touch on that t- with you later about, like, what's it going to be like to be a Christian in mm-hmm. an industry like Hollywood, which is not- notoriously not very... Uh, it's just you know they're just they have different views to a lot of you know yeah uh christian uh face and stuff but but yeah um yeah you're right uh people shouldn't be like jerks to people and i think people weirdly like the younger filmmakers who grow up loving this art form they sort of start idolizing these directors and they start they sort of idolize these stories about francis ford coppola or stanley kubrick yeah kubrick and, is one that's like right man i don't know i'm not a huge kubrick guy mm-hmm. i will obviously give respect to him as a great filmmaker but like yeah he's yeah, just one of those dudes fun. that i'm like mm-hmm. i don't appreciate your working methods so i don't know if i'm gonna really appreciate your films in general no i got you yeah there are some people who are like oh you know, some of the greats did that, so I have to do that. You know, it's like the whole, you know, we have to do it. And Christopher McQuarrie was on a podcast. I can't remember, uh, I can't remember what, what podcast it was, but he was talking to another filmmaker, and he says that he talks to a lot of young filmmakers, and they're always like, I want, they're always saying that they want, like, their apocalypse now. You know, like, they want, like, that film that... You know, and he's like, you really want your apocalypse now? So you want to, like, go insane and, like, <laughs> and like get dehydrated and, like, have a heart attack on yeah. set and, like, have half your set blow away and, like, pulling out your own hair every second of the yeah. day? Like, that production was, is a notorious nightmare. Yeah. It's like, you want that? And Christopher McCoy was like, no, you don't want that. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like. And I was like, yeah, it's so true, you know? Yeah, there's, I think in the arts in general, you know, you look at a lot of great artists um, and they just lead these kind of tortured lives. Yeah. And they're the tortured artists and there's the broke artist. And I think people feel like if I'm not one of those, then I'm not going to be great. And like, maybe that's true. Like I've, I've wrestled and am wrestling with that question yeah. of like, I had a very blessed life. Same. Um, and even to the point of, like, you know, they say, like, comedy comes from a dark place. And I'm like, I I have no dark places. So maybe <laughs> I'm not going to be good in comedy. Um, and typically what is on my, like, brain for future films is not comedy. You know, there's jokes and stuff. But, right, and right. so it's, it kind of makes sense to me. But, um even with that is like, well, does that mean I'm going to be out of the hands of greatness um, since I don't have some tragic life? Uh, Mm -hmm. But that's the reframing of the spiritual walk with Christ. That's like, uh, you know, and we're wrapped up as Americans in that, like our work is our identity and our legacy and all these things. Mm -hmm. That's like, no, my legacy is how I, how I am remembered by my family and yeah. like how my wife is going to uh feel when i come home and spend time with her and you know my future kids like yeah. what what am i going to leave for them uh in their memories when they're going on and then how how is that going to affect my lineage down the line and the people that you know spread out from that like mm-hmm. like i have a hard time believing that uh you know if like I was that screenwriter under Bruckheimer, mm-hmm. you know, when he died of like 50 something because he was just like doing coke all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be going to his funeral. I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd be like, you know what? I'll yeah, I'll say something on the mic every single day at 4 p.m. He would call me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know what? I don't really feel bad. <laughs> tell me I'm trash. So right, yeah. y'all are lying or right. you, do, you knew a different person than me. Right. Um, and so like. Greatness, um, and this is this is kind of like a 
a, a cool theme within the movie The Green Knight, which is another favorite of mine. Yeah. That has reached my, my top four slots. Mm-hmm. Um, as they kind of propose this question of, like, what is greatness? What is it to be great? Yeah. Um, and you may want to be a great filmmaker, and I do want to be a great filmmaker. But before that, uh, I mean, to be completely honest, I want to be a great disciple of Christ. Yeah. Um, underneath that, I just want to be a great man. Yeah. Um, and that, if that means that I sacrifice being a great filmmaker on the altar of being a great man, uh, mm-hmm. I think that's, I will, I will gladly take a C-listing direct, director title. Yeah. Um, as long as the people that I care about, uh, and even the people that I don't know, um, that mm-hmm. come into contact with me know that like, I genuinely cared about them yeah. and that, uh, I would have wanted their well being and would have helped them out. For sure. That's, that's great that you mentioned that. Cause I mean, let's just dive into it right now. Like our faith, you know, everyone has a different story when it comes to their faith mm-hmm. and, um, how would you say that your faith has sort of like elevated your work? Like what, what's your kind of journey with your faith that correlates to the films you make? And I'll give mine as well. And then, uh, and also kind of maybe give your thoughts. I know me and you share the same thoughts, but the audience doesn't know, uh, about like the Christian film industry, Hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so sorry, first question was it was uh how's how, like how does your faith influence the films you make? Yeah. Um I mean they my faith and my commitment to intimacy with Jesus is uh is branded into um the very desire to be a filmmaker. Yeah. Um is is seeing the example of a creator and a narrative and a cosmic narrative yeah um that uh is an an eternal everlasting narrative mm-hmm. um that is uh being written and is written somehow um and seeing the example of my creator uh and trying to follow and be like him in that way and in, in the gifts that he's given me and the calling that he he has for my life and the purpose that he has for my life mm-hmm. um so it's it's baked into the types of stories i want to tell it's so always the in the craft, dna of yeah the, yeah mm-hmm. it's baked into the craft mm-hmm. and it's baked into the working philosophy of like how do i treat people how yeah. do i like the people that i pull on the set am i being inclusive does does the grip sound and actors all feel like uh even though they're yeah even though there is a set hierarchy and i think it's good to follow that for the sake of efficient working conditions Mm -hmm. um does everyone still feel part of the family does everyone feel part of the team does anyone feel outsid um that's important you know because i've been on sets where the the above the line people would just stick to themselves and they would treat the below the line people like dirt and i'm like why? <laughs> yeah, know? like I don't have to be here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, especially when it comes to treating people, obviously Jesus lays out, um, you know, how important it is to love your neighbor. Yeah. And to treat others as you would like to be treated. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's crazy that we have separated the golden rule from the guy who spoke it. That's crazy. Wild. Um, is nuts. <laughs> so weird. It really is. You'll, you'll pass some bar who has it on a chalkboard. That's like treat others the way yeah. you want to be treated anonymous. And it's like, it, no, no, it is <laughs> no. not anonymous. I dude, I remember, sorry to kind of sidetrack here, but I was, uh, speaking at a, uh, elementary school when I was, uh, about to graduate high school. And, I didn't say this, but you know, it's one of those things because I didn't prepare speech. And then I was thinking afterwards and I'm like, oh, I should have said that. But like what <laughs> I was going to say was I wanted to bring God into the speech. And what I should have said was, you know, there's someone who said treat others the way you would want to be treated. And, uh, you know, that's not a saying. It's a quote. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I'd be like, look up who said that quote. 
Yeah. You know, but uh, look yeah. at you being wanting to be evangelistic. I'm I'm trying. I'm trying. But but um, but, yeah. Anyway, go on. Yeah. So that's at the core of like. I mean, that's in the business deals of like. Yeah. Be firm. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, Jesus says, "Be as as shrewd as vipers, but as gentle as doves." So it's like. Draw your lines. Have boundaries. Stick to them firmly. Exactly. Um, don't don't be a pushover. Like mm-hmm. that's you know it is okay to be firm and direct and mm-hmm. and have a certain like gumption to be like I'm not gonna take any crap, but I'm also going to be treating you with respect mm-hmm. and stand my ground respectfully. And that's really hard to do. Obviously, yeah. you know Jesus Jesus calls us to love our enemies, and when you're you know. And human nature says, you yeah. know, you know. Yeah, and you you can just imagine being like, you know, it's it's your shot. You you got your, you know, you're standing in front of like David Zaslav or some other executive in the future, and and then they're and like, he's We're like, not showing your film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, or they're just like trying to do things, and you're like, you know what, you're kind of feeling like an enemy right now. I yeah. don't know if I'm gonna love you. Yeah. Um, so it's hard, but. Uh, you know that that comes down to like the guy who's like trying to kick you out of a location that you locked in, yeah. Um, and, and being like, okay, am I gonna treat this guy res- respectfully? Um, mm-hmm. Can I still like treat him respectfully, but still trying to get what I want? Um, and do I do I genuinely care about this guy's well being as well as my actors? You know, I think this whole like int- intimacy coordinator stuff going around mm-hmm. um, is good question yeah. mark okay but uh also and gen z is actually on the forefront of this of like why do we why is this a necessity to have uh gratuitous sex in True. movies and shows and like True. did we ask a actor if they were comfortable with doing this um some people so are yeah. but like uh, you know if that's the case that's the case but i, I never want to be in a place of a power dynamic that's like Hey, I wrote this sex scene. Well, first of all, as a Christian, a yeah. little, a little sus. It's like okay, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but even you know, to to almost in danger of seeming prudish, mm-hmm. I will even say like, I want to be careful about just kissing. Uh, it's mm-hmm. like if if I know an actor is in a committed relation, not in a committed marriage, yeah, and they've made vows, uh. Then I want to honor those vows. If they're like, you know what, I've been feeling really convicted lately about like, I've had a lot of the scenes with ladies, and I don't really want a whole lot of scenes with ladies. Yeah. And be like, you know what, totally fair. Yeah. Um. Let's see how we can like rework this, you mm-hmm. know, love angle of the film, and so that the affection is done differently. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that that all you know, it's that kind of thing that stems from a commitment to Christ, which is really a commitment to our neighbors and our people and the people that are in the film and like a movie should not come between a person and their convictions. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's funny you say that because, you know, to dive into like what I've been going through lately was, uh, is like, you know, I've made a lot of films that, um, were not necessarily, I don't want to say they weren't Jesus centered because Jesus was in the DNA of them, you know, mm-hmm. but like, um, it's just like, uh, you know, like I made a film called fragments, which had biblical overtones and like, um, you know, it, I, I made that from a place of like Christian, my Christian values. But then I also have things like Aaron black or like just some of my horror films that I'm like, you know, I'm mm-hmm. just going to make this like, fun horror film you know but then sometimes i'm like i'm like man like i really like kind of like don't want to make content like that at Mm. sometimes where i'm just like yeah you know like i i I just don't want to make anything like gratuitous like you know like i have some horror films that have messages and like yeah there's deep spiritual messages and those can definitely exist for sure for sure you know vlog number one is like don't be a jerk kind of thing (laughs) and like don't hang off is about trauma and like you know missing those who pass on and and stuff like that and but then you know like covet the film i just did for this competition there was 
you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's tough when you enter a competition. And yeah, you're, yeah. You're boxed in with certain restrictions, yeah. and you're also collaborating true with people true. that are that are going to bring their own stuff to it. True. Um, I mean, there was still like a theme to it, like "Don't covet." Like even the title, like I yeah. came up with the title because you know it was a thing about jealousy, and I'm like, "What about covet?" Like we should name it that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I remember working on that film. I'm just like, I got to do something more christ focus you know i gotta i gotta do something mm -hmm. more convictions because i feel like i'm slipping into this realm of <laughs> i just want to make something entertaining mm -hmm. you know i just want to make something entertaining something fun yeah and it's like th that's fine like you can do that but i feel like your morality your convictions you know who you are as a person should always be woven in the dna of the thing you're making yeah you know and um and that goes into voice touching from earlier but yeah continue sure. yeah and um i just you know i feel like i i haven't done that with like the last couple films i made so i'm really trying to to do that you know because it's like i don't know i i kind of just feel like i i need to make something that's more personal rather than mm. just fun stuff yeah you know which is kind of like ironic because I'm sort of making this, my next film is like sort of just like fun, mm -hmm. but like I'm working on more, you know, faith-based stuff. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think there doesn't have to be like a dichotomy there of like fun and faith can't exist simultaneously, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and I am not in the boat that says that. Um, a Christian has to always create work that is, uh, you know, has an altar call and is like right. very Christian, you know? Yeah, like very, like, and, and th that touches on the one question where it was like, what do we think of the Christian movie industry? And it's like, yeah. a lot of it is very sugar-coated, um, preaching to the choir, you know, films that are made by Christians for Christians and no one else. Yeah. And like I don't necessarily want to do that. I want to reach people. You right. know. And you know, the thing there is like there there can be sincere filmmakers behind that and that's fine again like mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm really going to be in the audience for a lot of those. Uh right. I know I definitely know people who would be. Oh, and for sure. They need movies too. Yeah. Even <laughs> though they're not the ones that I would suggest. Yeah. Um and if they enjoy them you know, God bless them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, um, but, uh, you know, just thinking about stories, right? Like, like that's what a film is. That's what a book is. That's what, uh, you know, well, I guess a narrative book. Um, yeah. But, like you, we tell stories every single day as people. Mm -hmm. um, and... And I can tell you a story of my day and has absolutely zero things to do with Jesus, but it's just my story and my experience and what I've experienced. And, right. um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and some, some stories I have are deeply woven into Jesus and, mm -hmm. you know, in the Christianese, we'd call those a testimony. Yeah. Um, and those can be very powerful and very, uh, you know, rewarding to share with other people and, and we're empowered to share those, you know. That's what yeah. Revelation sh says that we we will be saved by uh, the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimonies. And and um, the next verse always gets forgotten uh, about um, about laying down our lives. I'm forgetting it now, <laughs> but there is still more than just blood of the Lamb testimony. It's also the willingness to yeah to be a martyr. Um, yeah, but. Um, so we're encouraged to share our testimony, but like you look at Jesus's parables, right? Like right. they are obviously communicating a heavenly truth, mm -hmm. um, but they're not wrapped up in all this gloss of like, uh, Pastor Sam went over to right. uh, do, you know, visit the widow and, uh, you know, uh, and then he preached to a fish that flew out. I don't know what would ever right, happen, right. but like, <laughs> you know. Any of these like Christian movies that are like very well, the word is pandering. Yeah. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Pandering and um They're pandering, they're cheaply made. Cheaply made. They're 
Uh, the other P word would be propaganda. Mm, mm-hmm. And so it's like preaching and propaganda and uh, pandering all together. Yeah, which, Those are the three P's of a Christian movie. Yeah, which if anything brings people away. And that's, it, it shoves a lot of people away because, you know, we're called to to spread the gospel to non-believers. Yeah. You know, and there's there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than, you know, one uh you know one uh what is it one uh i'm spacing out. yeah it's like <laughs> but hey heaven rejoices yeah, after yeah, one yeah, repentance yeah exactly you know, that's like, important like there's more there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents and it's like i feel like you you need to you need to understand these people yeah because like the thing is if you're making a Christian movie by Christians for Christians, it's like you're not reaching anyone at that point, pretty much. You have to understand these people because a lot of Christian media portrays the world as what they would like it to be rather than what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the world is not like this. Yeah. You know, um, but this is the way they want the world to be, which is usually like this sugar coated, happy go lucky. You know, no one swears, no one does anything yeah. provocative, and I'm like, I'm sorry, and, you know, I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's not the world we live in. Like, yeah. we live in a fallen world, you know. So even as a pastor's kid, that is not my reality, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And like growing up in the church and being a youth pastor, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just not my reality. My my reality is not a G rated place. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I honestly don't think anyone's. <laughs> reality can even be a G rated yeah. place, you know? Maybe in the South. Maybe in the <laughs> maybe in the Bible belt. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> maybe there's a whole place of America that I'm missing. <laughs> maybe just people in the Appalachians just <laughs> chilling by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's like you have to understand how these people walk. You have to understand how they talk. You have to come from a place of understanding and compassion. And I think that's what's gonna get people to open themselves up to you. And that's why I, I've listened to people talk about um, Fury or Silence mm. or Hacksaw Ridge yeah. or even The Passion of the Christ even. Um, and they're like, you know, they seem to really respond to those films yeah. a lot more than like God's Not Dead. Or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Which... Again, I don't want to like come down. I've, I actually was very uh, blessed to have a conversation with Harold Crank, Cronk. Oh, really? Uh, the director of God's Not Dead, because he was connected to my school. Cool. Um, and so, you know, eye-opening conversation. Uh, yeah. And in def in many different ways. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rag on anyone, even though. You know, there's plenty of films out there that are not my cup of tea and I could, you know, tear apart. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's a miracle that a movie gets made, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, mm-hmm. But there is this place of, like, what is what is really going to impact people more? Uh, and I don't really know, you know? I guess mm-hmm. it depends on the people that you're trying to reach. And that's yeah. that's an important thing is, like, a hard thing that I'm going through right now in my spiritual walk is allowing Jesus into the creative conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think with certain mediums, it's really easy to to bring Jesus into the creative conversation. Like make yeah, make paintings you know, and paintings. You think of, I feel like it's so simple to write a song for and about Jesus. Super yeah. simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think simultaneously as a singer songwriter, I have no problem with that same singer songwriter writing a song about his wife or just love in general and yeah. you know something romantic and sweet mm-hmm. uh, or really uh, you know the the dark night of the soul of mm-hmm. communicating like uh, really hard grief things yeah um, and there's still redemption in that and still mm-hmm. Jesus in that or they talk about the struggles like maybe with addiction or they yeah. even go. They they talk about being saved, you know, yeah. like from the from the pit. You know? Yeah. 
And so, um, and so I think that's the hard thing as filmmakers is trying to make Jesus, uh, an exec, an executive producer <laughs> and a collaborator in the screenplay. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's sorry to interrupt, but like, that's funny because I'm kind of, I don't want to say terrified, but like I do kind of dread like the idea of like there's going to be one day where I'm sitting in an office with a big time studio executive or producer and they're like, so I liked your script, but you know, the the religious <laughs> overtones, you know, I'm not a fan, you know, we got to remove that. Or it's like this dialogue about Christ and being what it means to be a Christian like, eh, that's, you know, that's, that's going to lose money. That's not going to gain money. So you have to take that out. And it's like, it's going to be tough because it's like my dream is literally, you know, one initial away from signing being like, oh, like, yeah, we'll make this movie. But my convictions are saying, no, like I can't succumb to that. You know, yeah, I, I have to be like, no, I will not take that stuff out. That's not who I am. That's not what I believe. So, no. Yeah. You know, it's going to be hard to say no, but it's like that's something that we're, we have to do, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think uh, in general it's, uh, it's a little hard to, like, you know, within that scenario of, like, how far along you are in the process of making, like, is it, are you just presenting a script? Is uh, it a yeah. cut film already? Uh, at that point, like... You know, were they just like were they the studio that backed your film and greenlit the script without those changes? Um, and mm -hmm. so you've already like edited the film, or uh, or is it already a made film that you know a studio bought, um, you know, and, and acquired, and want to make some changes? Uh, but I think that's all on the business side of things that you're like, yeah, you know, uh, this is the deal. This is the deal as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you have not communicated anything about my faith-based practices with communicating in the film. Mm -hmm. So uh, the deal is those stay in. If you want to change that, I'm going to walk. Uh, yeah. And I'll you know produce this independently or whatever, even though that's super hard. Right. Um, but I think that it's those kind of moments where, um, one... We have the opportunity to uh, live into the self-sacrifice that Jesus calls us to and be like, oh, yeah. this is really going to like just cover my mortgage if I just get this film right. out. Right. And not that I have a mortgage because I'm a millennial, you know. Right, of course. Um, and, you know. What's a house? Yeah. Home ownership doesn't exist for me yeah. as an option. But, uh, <laughs> you know, student loans. Anyways. Um, but it's like, oh, man, this could really pay off my student loans. Uh, but... Um, yeah, I think I think following Jesus is probably good. Yeah, exactly. I think here. eternal life is is eternal life is more important than yeah. uh, you know, than and that's <laughs> The second thing I want to say though is that I do not encourage uh uh you know, taking the deal and sacrificing your beliefs. Exactly. Um, yeah. But I also have been in a place with much lower stakes that I have compromised on. Uh, and the Lord has shown me grace. And so if... I've been there too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if, if people find themselves in that place and they end up compromising, um, then, uh, you know, there's there's grace and, you know, God will gladly take you back just as... For sure. Uh, you know, the father in the prodigal son. And great parable. Great story. But, um, yeah. So do you think that... Obviously there are sections of... Christian media, obviously there's like pure flicks, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but then there's like angel studios now, which is trying to, you know, they're, they're taking more, uh, risks. Mm -hmm. They're being more edgy. They're being more serious. Mm -hmm. They're making more serious films, but like, so would you kind of want to be in like that space or do you want to be more in the more in the traditional Hollywood space? And if so, do you think a Christian, at least someone with Christian values as strong as ours, um, do you think that they could coexist in that 
industry? Like, do you think it's possible, you know, because there's so much outside force in the industry that pushes against a lot of Christian yeah. values? Like, let's just be real, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, Christians should exist everywhere, you know? Like, mm-hmm. that's that's the thing is, like, I think there should be Christians in Hollywood. I think there should be Christians outside of Hollywood. I think there should be Christians in the schools. I think there should be Christians in the marketplace, in ministries, uh, in politics, as Republicans, as Democrats, as controversial as that could sound. Mm -hmm. But in all of those scenarios, Christ is king. Christ is on the throne. Um, And you are going to dictate your choices uh, by his teachings and your commitment to those. Absolutely. Um, and, And Jesus challenges every single one of those things it doesn't matter uh you know what part of life that you find yourself in what industry you find yourself in um there is going to be parts where jesus challenges that he even probably challenges the institution of marriage and and our assumptions about marriage Mm -hmm. um when it's just you and your spouse um yeah and and so life with jesus uh, I think has to exist everywhere, does exist everywhere. Um, and for me personally, I would love to play in the, the, the Hollywood sandbox. Mm-hmm. Me, both of you and I are huge comic book geeks. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, and, and love geek culture. So like, I would absolutely love to, to make a superhero film. Oh, absolutely. And, and be a part of that machine, even though like everyone hates it or whatever, and even if it goes the way of westerns, like I will, I will want to make a superhero movie. Exactly. You know, I, I love. We're sitting right next to three boxes full of comic books. Yeah, I want to make. True. Uh, you know, if some, if Marvel was like, "Hey, kid, we're desperate. You want to make Spider-Man?" I'd be like, "Yes, yes. sir, I do." Uh, I, dude, I've written straight up outlines for Fantastic Four, Thunderbolts, and this was before Thunderbolts was announced, yeah. and Fantastic Four, and uh, X Men. Like the rebooted X Men. Yeah. Like I would, like I have story. I, like I'm ready to pitch to Marvel those ideas. <laughs> like I literally have pitches for those ideas. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like I'm ready. You yeah. Know? Um. So yeah, I would love to play in the Hollywood sandbox. Absolutely. And and integrate my Christian faith into that space as well. For um, sure. But if it's not in the cards, then it's not in the cards. Yeah. Uh, and if. The thing is, from listening to um, artists of various mediums, Mm -hmm. mostly in the music realm, um, it seems like they're just, it just seems like Hollywood and the system of the world just really cares about making money. Yeah. And they don't really care about anything else. About anything else. So Mm -hmm. if you are able to phrase things, that's like, this is going to hit a very specific niched market that is mm-hmm. the christian market um and you can make money there i don't think that's a great motivation uh right but it's there um and they're like you know the the random christian division of sony is like yeah let's do it or like you know i think Lionsgate, one of these big companies had like a christian division mm-hmm. and is like was making movies aimed towards uh that as a genre as a audience market not as a like uh like the realization of when you put christian something like christian Mm -hmm. rock band christian uh singer whatever Mm -hmm. christian movie christian rap you are not Mm -hmm. labeling it as a creator who creates of faith Mm -hmm. uh you are participating in marketing yeah. You are a market, mm-hmm. uh, and and I don't want to create that way. Um, Sam. It's kind of like Lecrae. He says, I'm not a Christian rapper. I'm a Christian who raps. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. He's, he's uh, he was definitely a Christian rapper at the beginning of his career. He's definitely, <laughs> he's grown and matured, and I really like that. Um, yeah. His but, new album talks about his deconstruct. He actually deconstructed yeah. for a while. But now he's like back to, yeah, you know, which is um, really good. Yeah, he's he's had a lot of cool, uh, mm-hmm. kind of like conversations lately. But yeah, it just seems like 
if I can if I can pitch something and I'm like, hey, it can make you money, mm-hmm. or like I can I can accurately be like, this is how much you're gonna be in the red, this is how much you're gonna be in the black. Um, here's your ROI. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe that can be the deal. That's like, okay, yeah, like you said, you can deliver on this with your with these things still in the movie. Mm-hmm. Like, sure, we can work with that. But right. if I get to a place that's like, um, you know, like Marvel is like, yeah, we don't really, uh, we're not really interested in pursuing that, like, you know, vision of uh, Silver Surfer or yeah. Daredevil, a, a Daredevil film that r- is really focusing on his faith, even though the show did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's integral to the character. Too, yeah. So, yeah. Um, or we're not interested in like a theologically inspired ghost writer that like has more theological thought, which mm-hmm. is something I would really like to That'd be awesome. produce. That'd be awesome. Um, uh, we're not really interested in that and in, mm-hmm. in being like, or like, what if you're making X-Men and they're like, yeah, we don't want Nightcrawler to be, um, Catholic. Oh yeah. That's a tough, I, you know, I'd be like, but that's, that's Nightcrawler's identity. Like that's yeah. who he is like yeah. in the comics. Like that's yeah. so integral to his story and his fate his personality it's like you know it's like what if you were like you know what if marvel's like yeah just remove that i'd be like i would be really disappointed i mm-hmm. don't know if i would pass on the opportunity that's because this is yeah. this is my thing is like <clears throat> at that point when mm-hmm. i'm working with another company's ip i am now a gun for hire i am working for a client yeah just as much as like I'm, you know, I'm I'm doing this edit right now for a tattoo shop. They're not hiring me as a Christian, yeah. uh, you know, content creator. They're just hiring me to do this True. video. True. So uh, I'm just making a tattoo reel for them. Yeah. Um, and, like, <coughs> I can highlight some of the, you know, Christian tattoos that they've done. Right. Uh, but the particular piece that the guy's tattooing isn't very Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that goes into interesting territory of, like, this isn't my property. This isn't my project. I'm, right. you know, a lot of directors have walked away because their vision couldn't be fulfilled mm-hmm. in the Marvel machine. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, if I got to, you know, that place uh, and they were like, yeah, we don't really love this. Um, I think I would feel comfortable enough to be like, Okay. Gotcha. As long as I'm not producing something that completely goes against right my morals, right mm-hmm. my ethics, um, that's like, yeah, we don't want to do that Christian stuff, but Satanism is really hot right yeah, now. Yeah, right. We right, want right. to make Wolverine <laughs> a satanic, you know. Yeah, it's like, um, nah, I'm like, no, I don't think so. It's like, I, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean. And so that's like, okay, you're not going against me. You're just like not it, yeah. letting me play to the fullest. So. I feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, but there are also, like, characters within that that, like, uh, it's like, oh, man, I would really love to do a certain certain version of this character. Yeah. Um, uh, that maybe I could, you know, do this way, but... Yeah. Uh, if they say no, say no, they say no. Um, and that goes into other IP, too, that's... Uh, you know, that we might enjoy. Um, True. I, um, I really, I, <laughs> I actually pitched it to my friend. Uh, so I have an idea for o- Obi-Wan season two. <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi season two. Cause I'm a big Star Wars guy. Um, and you know how I would just tell a story and there's a lot to it, but one thing is like, I want to dive into the religious aspect of the force, yeah. you know, because that's what they say. Like Han Solo says it's an ancient religion. Like, right. And then you want, and then you play something like, I don't know if you play Jedi, uh, fallen order. Yes. Um, but like they're, they tap into like a lot of like religious aspects. Like you go to the planet Zepho and there's like, there's icons on the wall that are like basically, the same iconography of uh, like the Greek Orthodox Church, yeah. for example. So, um, you know, so it's, uh, I wanted to dive deep into that. So, yeah, that'd be cool. 
Yeah. I forgot if I was heading toward a point. I just, <laughs> I, I just yeah. Yeah. All this is like a long shot, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fun to dream. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. But <clears throat> also I think, um, this kind of stems into like where the industry is going, mm-hmm. uh, of thinking about like, I have, I have written down in my list of, uh, <clears throat> Of like this next script that I'm writing, I'm writing it on a with a pencil and paper right now. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah, um, which has been uh, very different than when I was typing out my first one. (coughs) And I've uh, within that book listed out every single film that is non-IP that is like completely my story Mm -hmm. um, and my my idea. That's a good list, um, and I'm happy with that. And I think thinking about um, just the different aspects of filmmaking is like th- these are going to be the most rewarding projects I work on. Oh, for sure. If I if I work on like a superhero film, that's going to be like Cloud Nine. That's going to be super dope. I'm going to love that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to have a great time, and maybe I won't have a great time. I don't know <laughs> right, with right. the Marvel machine <laughs> or you know DC or you know whatever I right. Star Wars out there. Mm-hmm. Um, all those are super cool. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, all the creators, and I I mean that in, like, artists of uh, different mediums of, like, you think of C.S. Lewis, you think of J.R.R. Uh, R. Tolkien, J. R. R. Cho- Tolkien. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think of just different bands out there that you love. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they are not cover artists. They are not producing, you know, stuff that a company owns. Uh, they are they are making their own stuff, and yeah. that that at the end of the day is like, sure, I would love to play into the mythology, the modern mythology of of studio IP. Yeah. Um, even though I can see that also being soul crushing. Right. But, um, you know what I make, uh, in these sets, like no one can stop me from making these. Like these are right. all my ideas, and like. A studio could be really interested in one of those products or, or projects and like be like, yeah, we'll fund it and it's it's ours. I don't know if I would love that actually. Right. Um, that's a whole, that's d- diving deep into rights issues. Yeah, and, exactly. And like, that's, that's the thing that's on the business side. It's like, no, this is my baby. Right. I wrote this script. Exactly. If you want to buy it, you're going to buy it when it's finished mm-hmm. and I've made it. Yeah. And I can get the royalties. Yeah. Um, if those exist in the streaming age anymore. Right, but, seriously. Um, but that's, uh, that's the, like, Guillermo del Toro talks about all the time of, like, oh, I have, like, a bunch of movies. I've, I There's, like, 20 movies I've wanted to make, and I haven't done it. And I've always just mm-hmm. been, like, why? Right. Why haven't you made them? Like, you're right. Guillermo del Toro. Go make them. Right. Um, what's stopping you? And it's, like, oh, I, I don't know why. I don't know. And, yeah. like, every director hits this point of like there's movies that they wanted to make but they couldn't for whatever reason yeah um some of those could be valid some of those could just be like the studio wouldn't take my movie Mwah. and it's yeah. like you don't need this st- you didn't start with the studio like right i mean maybe someone did uh out of all those people but like go make your movie like you're you're a top director like why stop like if you own the idea, go make the movie. Right. And don't let like something as silly as like uh, well, I don't know. I struggle with this, but I was gonna say don't let something as silly as quality keep you from making something independent, even if it's gonna be like a little bit scrappier than what you make it with a studio. Yeah, I um, I, I struggle with that. Yeah. Even, but um, I I think you might like. I, there's a phrase called don't let perfect be the enemy to good enough yeah so maybe it's kind of like like that's what kind of you're saying it's like you don't want to you don't want to make something too perfect to the point where you overdo it and then you start cannibalizing it you know what i mean so um yeah there are some movies where you have to cut corners and the movie might be better for it you know yeah but going to that a lot of filmmakers especially the old guard would say that original film is dying. And a lot of that is because of 
big studio IP blockbusters, blah blah blah. And I don't really agree with that. And but like, like, what do you like think about that exactly? Um, I think original films are dead in the studio system. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's a both and kind of question of like, yeah, you're right. Like, whoa, it's it's so cool that you can see the times that like. Warner Brothers isn't taking risk, and they're only doing sequels, or only doing IP. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, welcome to today. Like, everyone knows this. Common right. knowledge. Um, mm-hmm. That, like, they are completely risk-adverse. They're not going to make anything that's uh, original. And, like, maybe something seeps through the cracks. <clears throat> um. Especially if it's by, like, a established director yeah. or something. Because it's like there's some there's something they can market off of it, you know? Yeah, and it's only going to get worse. Like, uh, like I don't suspect Napoleon's going to rake it in. Marvel's didn't even rake it in. It's established IP. It's in the franchise. Yeah. Um, somehow, Just, mm-hmm. Sound of Freedom beat out Indiana Jones this past summer. True. Um, which is pretty crazy when you think about it yeah it Um, is and so like yeah i i think it's just gonna get worse because Mm -hmm. the studios are like how are we gonna make money uh because our current strategy isn't even working and it's because you shot yourself in the foot with streaming uh and Mm -hmm. now you're just reinventing cable anyway yeah i know um, i saw your thing (laughs) like they're 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 basically like combining all the streaming services. It's so weird. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> oh, uh, so it's cable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think Marvel's finally realizing this with like, they're like, oh yeah, we made like a bunch of major superheroes into TV shows and that has messed us up. Yeah. Um, and a lot of our films have, I don't want to say flopped, but they definitely uh, did not exceed expectations. Yeah. So they came in much below expectations. So I think, I hope they're taking a break. I mean, next year there's only one Marvel movie, you know, one MCU Marvel mm-hmm. movie. Um, so Whatever Sony's doing. Sony's yeah. just <laughs> <I don't laughs> throwing even. stuff at the wall. Yeah, Craven, Venom 3, and <laughs> Madam Web is coming out next year. And it's just like, yeah. okay, whatever, Sony. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Interesting concept, Sony. Yeah. It's Again, like, not going to yuck anyone's yum. Yeah. Not going to p- come against any uh, filmmakers. Yo, I got an idea. Let's make a Spider Man universe without Spider Man. Wild. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right. Um, interesting idea. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't think original films are dead. I just think uh, Hollywood could potentially be dead. And mm-hmm. the way that movies are made are going to change fastly because now and again this is an area that I've been wanting to get to within the conversation is mm-hmm. uh the uh where is the industry going yeah um and not that I'm like you know firmly established in it or anything but like just you know but we can theorize and yeah like, thinking about the craft thinking about the industry i want to be in i have to be like forward thinking about yeah well where is the industry going how am i going to make a living in this industry right um and streaming is on the rise but no one's making any money from that no one's getting residuals from that right um and uh you know we talked about micro budget no budget films that mm-hmm. are there um, with IndieWood and Hollywood, even IndieWood with A24 is like, yeah, we want IP. Uh, yeah. They just acquired uh, this PlayStation 4 game. Um, the one with... Uh, it's by the creator of Metal Gear, S- Gear Solid. Oh, Death Stranding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the, A24 just acquired that. Yeah, and they acquired uh, Friday, Friday the 13th. I don't know if you... That's wild. I did not know that. Well, yeah. Well, they're making a Friday Thirteenth uh, TV she, she, show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Produced by A twenty four. So even even the indie guys that are like, oh, this is an A twenty four movie. Those type of people are about to be really mad. Yeah. Because now A twenty four is making a franchise. Um, yeah. That's uh, well. I don't know if you heard, but <laughs> there's been talk that A twenty four actually wants to start making some more commercial films just yeah. because they need to start making. Like money, yeah. like I'm sorry to say, but like most A24 films don't 
make a lot of money. Yeah. So and, and you're starting to see it now with with like Alex Garland's like Civil War, yeah. like that, which looks, I think looks cool. Oh, it does look cool. It looks really <laughs> good. It looks really good. But it's like Alex Garland never disappoints. Exactly, he's a master. But like, if you removed a twenty four from that trailer, I'd be like, Paramount. Yeah, this is like this is not an a twenty four movie. Yeah, like, that would be the last. Studio. <laughs> the only thing that would of. the only thing that would sell me is K- Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> yeah. like, is it a twenty four? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, did Lars von Trier? Do, do, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah. So, and that's the thing too is like, you know, we're we're surrounded and we're we're steeped into this world, into this industry. So we. As cinephiles, I feel like maybe not like me and you, but like cinephiles in general, uh, they kind of forget that that we're actually a minority, mm-hmm. and like most people in the world are not cinephiles, and yeah. most people, most people who go to the movies just want to be entertained. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they unfor- it's it. it it, depending on who you who you talk to, I asked my uncle, "Hey, what's your favorite movie of this year?" Yeah. Indiana Jones. Exactly. Like, I All didn't right. even want to see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't know the appeal, but mm-hmm. cool. You, Enjoy. But, yeah, you're not gonna see a uh, uh, an indie drama film tone poem, you know, be yeah. on a lot of people's radar. You know, there's a reason those movies don't make a lot of money, and I think a lot of filmmakers and cinephiles they forget we're the minority and a lot of people um i think there's this pretentiousness with certain filmmakers being like oh superhero films big blockbusters are the only thing being made so the audience doesn't know like that's all that's being released so the audience blah blah blah. and i'm like okay that's kind of like crapping on the audience's intelligence a little bit i think people are smart enough to understand, you know, deeper films and, under, you know, they want, they, you know, they, they're taking a lot of credit away from the audience. Like, the, yeah. you know, the audience knows what they want and they just, a lot of people just want to be entertained, you know, yeah. but us, because we're cinephiles and we only talk to cinephiles, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, we're like, oh, why isn't, you know, the lighthouse making any money. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's my not... wife hates that movie. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I was a little iffy on it when I first saw it, but like, I understand like, Oh, it's like a retelling of Prometheus. And like, I, I get it. You know what I mean? And I'm sure a lot of people get it. They just, mm-hmm. they're like, I didn't like the movie. Yeah. Like it was boring. It wasn't entertaining. So I want to go see star Wars. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's what a lot of people think like, so and then they were like, "But why does it suck, though?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you give know. me Star Wars, but less suck. Yeah, um, but that's the thing. Like, the audience is smart enough to know what's good and what's bad. You know, mm-hmm. like a lot of filmmakers are like, "Oh, they don't know what's good until we tell them." Like, until we put out all this other stuff, and it's like, no, I think the audience can tell the difference between a good quality film and a bad quality film. You see that, you saw that this year, that 95% of every superhero film completely flopped. Yeah. You know, people are aware of what's a good film and a bad film. Guardians 3, great film, Mm -hmm. made a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, No offense, but The Flash, (laughs) uh, not a great film in my opinion. Uh, I had fun. Yeah, you know, but. That's all I needed. Yeah. That film uh, did not make a lot of money. But I understand the complaints of everyone. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I realize why. Yeah. So the audience is smart enough to know what they want, but you know, but I do think there it, there needs to be a balance between. Yeah. You and I know, think it's just kind of a marketing thing in general. Like yeah. you know, you think about yourself before you were a cinephile, and uh, into the industry. Yeah. And it's like I don't know any of these movies that are at the Oscars. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like. I don't know what this movie is, and and now you're like, how could you not? Like everyone's talking about this, right? All the critics that I, you know, follow on <laughs> right, on right. IndieWire are talking about this movie, and they're like, what the hell's IndieWire? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and so you know, uh, so marketing's there, and then you know they stumble upon it on you know a streaming service, and they're like, have you heard of this this new flick called Eighth Grade? 
um, right. that I've never heard of. And it's like, yeah, no, I, I saw that in theaters. Um, mm-hmm. Which is like, that's a nice thing about streaming. But um, mm-hmm. I think going into the industry and seeing that in particular mm-hmm. and seeing um, the unoriginal ideas coming out of Hollywood, like... I think just the trust in the studio system mm-hmm. is just going down. And like me, uh, the studio system is like not my savior. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean that in like a religious way. I just mean in a career way. Like, right. I don't think I'm going to like, if I get there, cool, like really cool. Um, I don't think I'm going to hang out there long though. I think I'm going to be looking at these guys who who are making movies outside of the system and then you know the system buys it and it's like hey we made this movie sony classics made this right uh, right and I mean, that's what a24 did for a long time yeah they just bought films right and they still do like they still do uh, yeah you know talk to me was that was uh, bought yeah right and mm-hmm. so like that system is still in place mm-hmm. and it's like it sucks because filmmakers want to have uh they want to have control they want to make a living mm-hmm um, and going the indie route, uh, and making it on your own and trying to get it sold into any distributor really, uh, mm-hmm. is a gamble because the yeah. distributors suck. They're awful people that have no good practices. Right. Um, the studio systems won't give you residuals cause it's the streaming age and there's no way to track that. Yeah. Or there's even easier ways to flub that. Um, the industry just needs like a rehaul honestly of like yeah so many things but i think it's in this place when we look at film history um that we could have a really revolutionary uh way of filmmakers making films and distributing them that Um, is that is true because we're seeing the the rise of all these different avenues right of being able to see and make art it's accessible to everyone right it's like painting now i mean so many filmmakers now are doing i mean not only filmmakers comic book artists and writers uh you know uh board games are doing the kickstarter indiegogo route Mm -hmm. um and that has its own problems and its own like tell me about it (laughs) (laughs) its own like weariness to it um but at the end of the day, like you get to keep your your thing, you know, and and it's you, the opportunity to make money off it doesn't stop, you know. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas like you sell the rights to it, and it stops, yeah. um, you know. It's interesting though because it it's very serendipitous that we were born when we were born because we like film. I think you said this to me once. Film is a a very young art yeah. form. Yep. It's like a new art form. Yeah. Like it's only like a hundred years old. Right. Which is like crazy. Like that we are within the first one that we are able to witness within the first one hundred years of an art form being born, you know? Mm-hmm. And or even like video games, like that's the newest, newest art form, you know, I would say. And that's changing like crazy. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that was like the 70s, right? So, 70s or 80s. So, um, so, yeah. Uh, and I it, think putting ourselves in that framework, in that mindset of like, okay, let me look at other mediums and see how the uh, the marketplace, the, the business side of these other artistic mediums, mm-hmm. how did that shape? And now where are they at? So you look at, uh, like, painting, um, mm-hmm. you know, we have, like, all these movements of the Renaissance and all these major painters. Uh, yeah. Some of them had, like, really great acclaim and were, mm-hmm. um, you know, were able to make a living off that. Some of them never saw a dime, but now their works are, you know, worth mm-hmm. millions, thanks to Vinci. Um, <coughs> poor guy. Uh which is crazy to think about. Like, all these artists who painted never saw a dime of their work, but now yeah. their work is worth something. It is crazy. Um, There's that joke that artists don't get famous until 200 years after their death. <laughs> and it's just like, I mean. <laughs> yeah. And so, looking at the medium, and it's like, 
accessibility, right? It's like you mm-hmm. see these, uh, you know, these artists who I'm not a, a, an art historian, so I don't know, mm-hmm. but um, you look at guys who are influential and maybe they came from money, maybe they were able to be educated into being a painter or uh, or an illustrator or whatever, mm-hmm. but then uh, the accessibility of materials becomes greater. Yeah. And so now the the uh the line of like what it means to be a great artist moves because now everyone can have access to it and now so that that tipping point uh goes higher and, and we're in the midst of that like, right exactly where, yeah mhm and so we're at this point of like now that filmmaking is so accessible mm-hmm. that everyone's making many movies on their phones yeah um and, and distribution is technically free with like YouTube or just yeah. the internet in general. Yeah, you know? exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes me think about um, just being content. As long as I can make my movies at a quality and I'm able to fundraise for a budget, I'm able to get an investor to mm-hmm. make money, or I pull on cast and crew for really cheap. Or whatever. Obviously, I want to pay everyone. You know, course, I want to be yeah. paid. Um, mm. But uh, I'd be really satisfied in just having a consistent audience that appreciates me. Um, that maybe that's just through Patreon and YouTube. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's other, you know, uh, other aspects of YouTube that I really like uh, that I would like to explore in terms of like kind of. Mm-hmm video essays and uh you know a little bit of like faith talk within that for sure um for sure youtube is that's a whole nother podcast it's a whole nother <laughs> conversation but yeah but then you get these guys like patrick h willems yeah and these other dudes doing nebula yeah and that's like that to me nebula is super interesting to me mm-hmm. i i have yet to ever give money through patreon to mm-hmm. ever sign up for nebula uh, or support a creator because I'm like you're giving me content for free, right? Uh, so I don't I don't know. Um, I I would love to support you, like you know we'll see if I throw in right. five bucks to Patrick H. Williams. Um, I would like to, yeah. but uh, but you think about that. It's like these guys are like these kind of YouTubers have these people who are consistently giving them money a month mm-hmm. and they're able to like up their production. Yeah. And like, you know, Patrick H. Williams has a whole team of writers. He's basically the new age TLC, you know, Turner Classic Movies, TCL. TCM. Yeah. TCM. <laughs> TLC. <laughs> <laughs> God, God, she is one. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I shed a single tear. That's right. Um, not a dry eye in the house. <laughs> and, uh, but you look at these guys and they're, I mean, Patrick H. Williams made, he's making like, Hour long video essays. Yeah. Like, brother, that's a feature length film. Yeah. That's a feature length documentary show, film, whatever yeah. that you're putting out and you're producing and making a living doing that. Yeah. Now imagine if you demystify the director, right? Mm-hmm. And you give audience more contact to a director. Like if, if Jeff Nif- Nichols. Was mm-hmm. like, hey, I'm starting Patreon. I would definitely sign yeah. up. I'd be like, yes, I will take whatever. I will invest. Like, I will For be sure. there. Um, yeah. Obviously, he didn't start that way. Right. But, um, you know, you get to a certain point. Like, if he did just make other videos about other things that he's interested in, and, and I resonated with those, maybe I would have from the start. Or, like, mm-hmm. just thinking about other YouTubers of, like, if Patrick H. Williams, like, pivoted and was like, you know, I'm going to pursue film altogether yeah maybe i would like it i don't know if he really makes things that i like um i actually haven't seen like uh <coughs> has he made like shorts or features or he made a feature okay um called night of the coconut it's on nebula okay and um i haven't seen it yet and to me i wasn't really loving all of that part of his sh- 
show. Uh huh. So I I'm not super interested. Gotcha. But it's like, hey, more like you made a feature, more power to you. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, and so if creators are able to balance, uh, balance that well, to uh, make an audience happen on YouTube mm-hmm. and they're able to have a con- consistent connection to their audience that their audience is funding their stuff. Um, honestly, I think, I don't know if it's uh, the immediate future, mm-hmm. but I think it will inevitably be the future of, yeah. um, of a lot of mediums, f- film, comics, mm-hmm. um, probably books and novels. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's pretty wild. There's there's a lot of like exciting potential with the future of film as an art form, but there's also like um, a lot of scary things, you know, like physical media, for example, disappearing, yeah. or you know, but who knows? It might have a huge comeback, or you know, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about AI, like what your uh, uh, thoughts are on AI. Because I've kind of uh, had an interesting evolution with AI a little bit recently, and um, but I I do think AI is kind of like that's also in the future. Um, I hope so. A lot of people are using it as a tool, mm-hmm. including myself. I'll admit it. I've used AI as a tool. Like when I'm making a, a film poster, I use generative fill mm-hmm. to like oh I need to remove this thing or I need to expand. Yeah. You know, this image, I'll just use generative fill. But, um, you know, I'm just nervous that I don't want a film made by a diffusion model. I don't want an entire film made by AI. Like, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's good. I think that spells death. Yeah, you know? for sure. So, um, but that scares me, though, because it's like we're seeing AI in its infancy and it's already advanced so much. Yeah. And it's like, where's that going? Like, that's a scary thought. Skynet. Like, I even, yeah, right? It's like, but um, it's just like, we're, we might get to the point where we just might be able to type in a prompt, like, make a movie about blah, 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 and then, like, it'll just appear on your TV. You know, like it's it's crazy. You know, I know yeah. that sounds crazy, but which would be so dumb. It would be <laughs> like, uh, you know, I think Steve Martin has this quote that's like, every everyone thinks they're funny, or everyone thinks that they have good taste. You know, mm-hmm. and the truth is, if you, you like what you like, that's really the truth. But yeah, uh, you know, some people just do have bad taste yeah. um, <laughs> but you know you like what you like and so you, if you want to type in uh you know um star wars made by uh wes anderson <laughs> wes anderson is the popular one which like to be honest if wes anderson made a star wars movie i would be there you right. know? um but i wouldn't be there if like uh you know i'm not interested in uh you know, true foe's interpretation of Star Wars. I don't even yeah. know what that would look like. I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't want to see Jean Luc Godard make a yeah. Marvel movie. Yeah. It's like, I don't even <laughs> know what that would look like. It'd be crazy. <laughs> I bet it'd be really interesting. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, just stuff like that. That's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm about that. Um, mm-hmm. have any- you used AI as a tool for anything in your projects yet? <clears throat> I have, uh, used, chat gpt once okay and i was looking up uh ironically uh titles for uh a youtube channel i want to start um and i was like dang i'm so mad i didn't come up with these ideas and they were staring (laughs) me right in the face right um and and that was the last time i used it because i was like i i want the credit (laughs) no i got you i got you yeah i've uh i've I've done things like that too. Like there was this, uh, uh, I wanted to make this fake eighties cheesy horror trailer. And, um, I'm like, just well, like list a bunch of fake cheesy 80 horror film. So it's like camp carnage and like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But 
but I eventually settled on one that I came up with. But, but yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. personally, um, I'm very against AI, mm-hmm. uh, and I, as as convenient as it is, mm-hmm. um, I think Americans just need to get to a point where it's like enough yeah uh i have enough and this is great Mm -hmm. um but it's like in so much of our society we're like get this thing it's so convenient it's convenient to have this thing Mm -hmm. um but it's like it's like oh well you know i yeah you're right it would be convenient but i wasn't really having a problem right it was work yeah sure but like i was okay with the work yeah you know and so i like there's just never a need or like there's never a stop in american culture to be like right. we just have to keep going and going and going until like where the you know the people in wally in floating chairs being right. fed <laughs> yeah. and it's like when will you stop like what will be enough and mm-hmm. the answer will never like never i will never right. have enough i will never like mm-hmm. it's just going to keep it's just going to keep going the yeah. machine's going to keep <laughs> turning so it's to just... the point where we're going to like just be comatose we're just me like comatose people in a comatose society yeah letting uh machines make the things that i wanted to do letting yeah. machines do the things that i wanted to do and it's crazy how much it has i hope it never happens but like like the it, i feel like the art world is like the first thing like like the first target yeah, this type of technology. I mean, for sure. Know? Like the first rollout was like, "Hey, change your profile picture to this cool AI generated thing." And right. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Like I didn't, I didn't even participate in that because I was like, it feels weird. Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't do that either, honestly. Um, I've I've used AI like as a tool, but I would never in a million years use AI as like a script writing thing yeah like even even if it's like write a scene between two people who blah 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 blah. i would like nah i'm like i can't i can't do that like that that's too far and that's the thing like that's that's craft like right there is like Mm -hmm. when you are when you notice and really at the core of it is insecurity you Mm -hmm. know it's like oh i'm not good at writing i'm not good at uh animating yeah, I'm not good at this, and I don't have the money to pay somebody else to do it. Um, so it's like it's insecurity and it's scarcity. Yeah, but uh, it will be worth it to overcome both of those. You will have such a better product overcoming both of those organically through a human means than if you did it through AI. And right. that's like that's my kind of soapbox on it. Of like mm-hmm. I I don't. I have enough, and there's enough creators out there that I can collaborate with mm-hmm. um, to be like, yeah, I don't know animation, so uh, you know, I'll try to save up some money. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. And and just bite that bullet uh, because yeah. that's the right thing to do. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's the thing is like we we haven't discussed morals and ethics in the conversation of AI. Mm-hmm. Somehow we've we've talked about like. It's not good to talk to your toaster in a demeaning way, you know, like that kind of conversation of ethics yeah. towards robots, yeah. unfeeling things. Like, you can't kick your robot, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I guess, whatever. But we haven't thought about, like, you know, and this is a general conversation of automation in general. And I can mm-hmm. I can see that. So that conversation has been had a little bit mm-hmm. uh, and more than a little bit. It's on, you know, every news channel in America. But, um, but like... When you're when you're creating something, why would you want any type of artificial noise within that uh, and within that process? And it's only for convenience. It's only for uh, insecurity, and it's only for uh, a means to an end because I don't have the money to pay someone else to do it. Yeah. And I just don't. Those are not compelling reasons to use it to me. Mm-hmm. Those are com. Those are very compelling reasons to run away from it yeah no i got you it's uh it, i guess one could argue that like film is artificial just like or like art is artificial like just in general but i feel like there is a human touch to these things like you know what i compare it to is like cooking 
you know, the culinary arts, for example. It, cooking is an art form. You know, it's called the culinary oh, sure. arts. And um, I see these things. It's like, uh, you know, these machines that they're rolling out that make uh, like like a, an entire machine makes a burger, you know, or like a, uh. a, a dish. Uh. Yeah. I don't know if I like this. Yeah. Kind of that. So it's like an entire. So you'll see the you'll see them you'll see a machine literally on a conveyor belt, like put the exact same amount of ketchup and mustard and mayo on like every single burger. Like it's everything is to the dot, like precise. And I'm thinking, what is my, this condiment? Oh, it's grease. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like literal engine oil grease. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, but my point is, is that is like, that's not cooking, like. Cooking is like people making those slight errors in measurements and like sort of just yeah. eyeballing it and like, you know, being a little messy. Like that human touch comes through in cooking. If a machine makes a burger, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to tell the difference between a machine made burger and a burger made by a grill master. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like there's there's going to be a difference, you yeah. know, and I, nine times out of ten, the the human made food is going to be better. And so I can apply that to art as well. You yeah, know? for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the difference, you know, the argument that like uh, art is artificial. Um, yeah, I could see it, but uh, within it is perspective, heart. Um, There's a truth to it. Exactly. A soul. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so that's the thing that uh, I just don't, AI does a really great job of like faking that because it's yeah. taking inspiration from other living artists, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But within the conversation, <clears throat> I don't know if there's a whole lot of distinction whenever people have this conversation between uh, the consumer side of AI art and the producer side of AI art. Of mm -hmm. like, um, when when I consume things. Uh, I just don't know if I am very interested in even if AI gets so advanced that like Vision is writing a screenplay or Vision from the Avengers is uh, you know drawing a comic book or something mm -hmm. um I mean, he's a synthesoid. It's a little different, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, if it gets to the point where someone could like just type in Sonny from iRobot, yeah, draws yeah, yeah. me a picture, yeah, um, like he's a disposable thing, yeah, and so I just I don't know. I haven't thought about AI that much. I'm not a big mm. sci-fi guy, so you know the right. whole like Ghost in the Shell, Matrix, yeah, uh, you know RoboCop conversation mm -hmm. um it's a it's a weird conversation to have and honestly i did not think we were going to have it in the art sphere like the fact that ai came and like instead of it being used to like i don't know clean up the ocean of plastics or mm -hmm. you know do something about pollution it's like it's writing screenplays and doing art and stuff and I'm like I never in a million years would have thought that AI would have in infiltrated the zeitgeist through like the arts like this yeah. is such a weird like even saying it like that sounds like an oxymoron you know like yeah. AI art it's like what you know it's like I thought AI was meant to like I don't know do st like stuff for your car or, like your hospital equipment or something like I, I was not expecting it to write screenplays and you know make yeah. photos and videos and stuff so on the consumer side i could i could see being tricked into enjoying something that ai has made mm -hmm. and being like oh that's kind of cool um <clears throat> but on the producer side as one who wants to create yeah um there will never be a shortage of people who want to create mm -hmm. and i would much rather give my attention and funds to those people to uh, yeah and that like that is a certain ethics about ai that's like like if warner brothers is like hey 
pay thirteen dollars to go see this AI generated movie. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, no, that's gonna be a hard pass. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. I'm not giving you any money to go see that. Yeah, I go give my money to the boutique film like, filmmaker down the road. Yeah, that uh, you know, actually put his heart and soul into yeah. it. Yeah, even though it, it doesn't look good, mm-hmm. I'm gonna go see that. Um, right. And yeah, so mm-hmm. AI is a weird thing. It's uh, it's convenient. I get it, mm-hmm. but um, what do you think of like y- you know Corridor, mm-hmm. like you know how they made the anime rock paper scissors? Yeah, the two videos. Did you see the making of like the sequel? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. Well, like they hired an artist <laughs> to make a bunch of mock-ups for them, anime mock-ups of them and of their characters because they acknowledged, they said, one of the biggest criticisms of the previous one was that they were using references from other um, anime and from yeah. other manga and stuff. So they they commissioned a artist to to do a bunch of mock-ups, but then they ran those art, that his art through the diffusion model and created, you know, anime rock, paper, scissors too and obviously there was a lot more that went into it but it really was like sort of like a com- combination of yeah of efforts like what do you think about something like that where it's like there is sort of a human touch there but they're using ai as sort of a like a tool almost like cgi like what what it, would you the first thought that comes to my head is that it feels kind of like taking advantage <laughs> it's <laughs> like hey we're gonna fa- pay you like 50 bucks to draw some characters and we're going to take what you made and like we're just going to like cheaply go make right. something else out of that yeah and it's like you could just you could pay me to do that like yeah. i would love to make a silly rock paper scissors uh animated short yeah and i would love to do that for you but rather you're interested in that which right. Is like a huge bummer. So like, so not only do I have competition in getting a gig from mm-hmm. other very talented yeah. people, I have to worry about the robot, and right? Like, which I will. There will always be a cheaper option, and now there will. Uh, yeah. That cheaper option is going to like ruin my prices forever. Yeah. Um, so I feel that. I feel that. Uh, so yeah, it just seems like a, a cop out. F- feels like you're taking advantage of someone. I honestly, if someone came to me with that project and was like, "Yeah, so we're gonna take what you you're gonna draw us a picture, we're gonna run that through AI generated thing and make like a little short film out of it." If somebody came to me with that, mm-hmm. I'd be like, um, "As desperate as I am for money, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna say no." Or it's like, or you could pay me to animate a short film. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is and. As a creator who would commission somebody, yeah, that's like, like right now in the midst of my film, mm-hmm. uh, there's like AI music out there, and I I need music for my film, um, and I want something like made specifically for it that hits all my boxes and hits a genre that I like, mm-hmm. and I could I could go the route of be like you know what I could go uh, just get what I need in AI, mm-hmm. and. I would rather take the risk of like, you know, uh, collaborating with someone and having to like fundraise or make some Mm -hmm. money or pay them because Mm -hmm. that's, that's the exchange of goods for a service, you know? Yeah. And if I'm just like, there's, there's no need to like the ethic of work in general Mm-hmm. and collaboration uh there's no need to uh you know pay a software company mm-hmm. even if it's for pennies uh to be my collaborator right um mm-hmm. that just seems silly i just think art i i just hope and think that art made by humans is always going to be on top you know that's that's what I'm that's what I'm hoping, you know. I guess I'm okay. Well, no. I guess I'm not okay. I was going to say with CGI art, uh CGI in movies being done done through that, 
but at the same time, that's taking no, away. Yeah, that's, was, that's yeah. still the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, taking away work from people who yeah, because who love this medium, who who yeah, devoted exactly. their like career life to this. Like these CGI artists who are already treated so poorly. Ugh, it sucks what how they're treated. Yeah, but like yeah, like when you look at like the Lion King uh, live action remake, uh, quote unquote live action remake. Uh, like say what you want about the movie, whatever. But like a lot of very talented artists, yeah, put their blood, sweat, and tears into making that look amazing, you know. And that makes it much more interesting to me interesting, than like impressive, impressive. Yeah. Then it's just like, oh yeah, we typed a we typed a prompt into a algorithm that says make Lion King, but make it live action. You know. Then I'd be like, nah, yeah. like nah. I'd much rather see the the hard work that people put into making something like that look real. To me, you know? that has absolutely no value. Yeah. Like what you just said of like, yeah, we put in Lion King into the CGI prompt generator. Yep. I'm like, cool. So I can just like trash that all I want. Because yeah. there's no one behind it. Exactly. Uh, and I don't care about the robot's feelings. It has zero value. Yeah, it has there's no zero soul behind worth. it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the guy who like typed the words like, well, I created it. It's like, mm, no, no, you typed words no. into a search bar. There's a reason right now, anyway, why AI art cannot be copyrighted. Right. You know, there's and a reason And I hope that, that stays. Yeah, me too. If software me companies too. try to make a bid for that, uh, I'm going to be like, then you have to share your revenue with the, the, the sample artists. Yeah. And if you're unwilling to do that or there's not a way to do that, then you do not get to. I mean, AI, the diffusion models that AI uses, like Stable Diffusion and Doll E and stuff, is technically, it's copyright infringement on a massive, unprecedented scale, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and Adobe, like Adobe Firefly, they take, they take images they they run the algorithm through their own images. So anything, all the stock images and stuff is owned by Adobe. Um, but still, even that, it's like, yeah, but an artist made that, though. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you sold it to Adobe, and I get it. It's a rights thing. But it's like, I don't know. I feel like they deserve something, you know, out of that. And it's just, uh, it's it, it, it really is copyright. And honestly, now you're seeing a lot of AI services most of them actually being uh monetized and i'm like i don't even think ai should be monetized i'm like that's weird i'm like that's that's uncomfortable yeah it's just like so you are making money off of this tool where you just type in a prompt and it makes you something and i'm just like but what service are right. you providing like i don't right. you know i it's it's just if you're going to do ai it shouldn't be monetize it, sh it should be open source it should be free and it should not be able to be copywritten which right now it's not able to be copywritten but who knows hopefully that doesn't change but yeah i mm -hmm. think there just comes a point again brings me back to like i have enough i don't mm -hmm. i don't need any more convenience i probably need less convenience <laughs> uh to be honest um i say that my soul and body doesn't actually want that, but it's probably what I need um, and what other humans need. Right. And, uh, and I think that uh, if America ever got to the point of, like, um, you know, copywriting AI or uh, all this other stuff, uh, I'd be really interested in, in moving out of the country and mm -hmm. going somewhere where... Life is a lot slower. I mean, I'm already interested in that. Uh, yeah. I've never had an interest in travel, really. Um, I've always been like, I want to be a filmmaker. That's what I'm trying to do. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the purpose. Uh, anything outside of that, even traveling, is like, no. Other mm -hmm. than, like, getting married. Um, but now in marriage, things are changing. And my wife is very well-traveled. And so uh, we're thinking about traveling outside of the country. And I'm getting stories from... People who live outside of the country where life is just slower, mm -hmm. uh, technology just isn't uh, that important. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, that seems healthy. Yeah. That seems nice. As a guy who's been to Europe and who used to have a house in Greece, I can very much attest that Europe is a lot slower 
but like in a good way and relaxing. As a kid, I didn't appreciate it, you <laughs> yeah. know. But yeah. like, because I'm like, oh, I want to do stuff. Like, because I like, want the jet ski. That's right, on right, right. This but car chase right now. Yeah, because like in Greece and a lot of European countries, but in Greece, there's like a there's like a nap time mm-hmm. in the middle of the afternoon. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, so it's I like that. <laughs> so like all businesses shut down for like two to three hours in the middle of the day for like a relaxation like thing so like so it's like nap time yeah for the whole oh, uh country it. and it's I like can it. you imagine doing that here oh <laughs> like oh like like no like oh my gosh you know and as a kid like i'm like oh i'd I want to go to the, you know, the arcade. I don't want to, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, like, now as an adult, I'm like, that's awesome. I want that. I need yeah. that. I need that nap time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but, yeah. Um, so, we've been talking for a while. two hours and nine minutes. <laughs> I knew it was going to, I knew it was going to be a long one because, yeah. you know, that it's us, you yeah. know. This, this is how we talk all the time. Yeah, you know when we're together. But uh, yeah, uh, anything else you want to touch on? You want to tell us about Sons of Thunder? Sure. Yeah. Um. So I'm working on a uh, proof of com- concept short film right now called Sons of Thunder. Um. I wrote a feature length film, uh, and have hashed out five drafts of it. Went through worked with a script doctor uh, and I have it at a really good place and I'm trying to move into making the feature a reality. So I made this proof of concept short film. Um, the process is going slow uh, and I'm <laughs> sad because I wanted it to be done already. Mm. But I am learning a valuable lesson in patience and that it's okay that things take their time and that you work with the people that you want to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if that takes time, that's okay. It's a virtue. And, uh, but yeah, so, um, the trailer's out right now, yep. link, link in the description. Yep. The trailer's out right now. I'm really happy with how it looks. I had such a great time making it. Um, it was stressful and cramped and, mm-hmm. uh, there was no sleep, <laughs> but, um, Been there. but it was great and I'm really proud of the film and I'm so excited to, uh, see people's reaction to it when it comes out. And I'm super excited to get uh, into the level of making the feature-length film happen. Uh, that would be such such a great experience. Um, and who knows? By that point, I might just be like, "Hey, I'm moving over to Nebula. So if you want to pay for it there, pay for it there." Right. Um, I don't know. It's really interesting to me. Uh, I don't know if my investors would appreciate that though. But anyways, gotcha. um, if you want to see it, YouTube link is there. And uh, if you like it so much that you're like, hey, I would actually love to see this as a feature-length film, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me on social media and tell me that, and even consider potentially donating some money to it because we need to cover some post-cost right now. Um, but I hope you just enjoy it. Um, Nico was a part of it, and yeah. it was great to have him on set. Uh, it's always great to have you on set. Thank you. And helping Thank out. You. Um and likewise, I love being on set with you for your projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Going to miss that. Going to miss that when you move. Yeah. We'll just have to, yeah. you'll have to fly out for some and I'll yeah. have to fly yeah, over yeah, for, for some. Sure. For sure. I mean, I, uh, I'm probably going to get out of here soon, <laughs> soonish as well. I'm just debating. It's like where to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm Right now, I'm kind of leaning Austin, Texas right now. Not a bad, not a bad idea. You know, so. Um, but, Try to link up with uh, Rodriguez. Rodriguez, man. I'm telling you. Double R Productions, a- yeah. FKA, uh, Troublemaker Studios. <laughs> um, yeah, but also Phoenix, you know, I got family there, so that's a big cushion. Yeah. And then... Uh, Do it. You'll be closer to me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I can commute to California, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Chris's uh, info will be in the description. Um, we're probably going to wrap this up here. Uh, but yeah, this is not the last you have heard of the man himself, Chris Mack. You'll be seeing his name in lights somehow. Just Ellie Strip 
LED strip ones in my living room <laughs> that I'm going to post on social media. <laughs> no, 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 no. It'll be on the marquees, baby. It'll be on the Cinerama marquee, which they removed. So, I don't know. But, so uh, it's in the junkyard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's where you'll see my name. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for... Uh, uh, hopping on episode three of the Kitchen Sink Podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. Always good to pick your brain, and I love it, and I wish you great luck in California. Thank you. And the podcast is going to end. Uh, what time is it? It's nine. Uh, I don't know if you still wanted to get food after this, but I'm always down, but I don't know if yes. it's, anything's open. But uh, yeah, uh, that should be it. So thanks again, and see you later. See you later.